to me, the mentality is a really simple one in, in the sense that the confidence comes from preparation. You know, so when the game's on the line, I'm not asking myself to do something that I haven't done thousands of times before, right? So when I prepare, I know what I'm capable of doing, I know what I'm comfortable doing, and I know what I'm not comfortable doing, you know, right? And so in those moments, if it looks like I'm ice cold or not nervous, it's because I've done it thousands of times before. So what's one more time? So that leads me to talk about a lot of uh, this Kobe tour this year in Asia is we, we reiterate the Mamba mentality. You know, can you talk a little bit about what the Mamba mentality is? Because that's something that's been developing over, not, I don't want to say 20 years, it's been developing for 35 years, right? Right. since you were a little kid, yeah. that Mamba mentality. Because you didn't start working when you got to the NBA, you started right. working when you were at Lower Marion, when you right. were in Italy, when you were five, when you were playing Nerf, Nerf basketball, yeah. right? So yeah. talk, about, <laughs> talk about the development of the Mamba mentality, uh, the pillars, the five pillars of this Mamba mentality, and then we'll kind of break it down. Well, I mean, I, overall, you know, the idea is a very simple one. And, you know, the Mamba mentality simply means trying to be the best version of yourself. That's what the mentality means. It means every day you know, you're trying to become better. And it's a constant quest. It's an infinite quest. So starting at the age of two, when I first started playing the game and on and on and on, I always ask questions. I always try to get better every single day, learn more, learn You were more, asking questions more. at two? Oh, dude, I was asking questions <laughs> all the time. I mean, you'd be surprised. Like some people, like my kids at two could do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. right? At two, I could dribble a basketball. I could shoot a basketball on the nerf hoop at the house. And I would go to practice with my father. I would observe my father. Um, I'd sit and watch games with him. And was so, he your first coach? Um, yeah, I man, I guess you could say that. You know, a lot of things I learned by being just being around the game. Mm -hmm. right? So by the age of six, I was already strategizing versus other six-year-olds, you know? The age of six, I figured out six-year-olds couldn't dribble with their left hand. And so I said, a lot, okay. A lot of 12-year-olds can't dribble with their well, left yeah, hand. Well, yeah, I would imagine six. So like yeah. when I was playing these six-year-old kids, I would make them dribble with their left because I knew they couldn't. <laughs> and so they dribble off their foot, I'd pick it up, lay it up. Do it again, dribble off foot, pick it up, lay it up. So at six years old, I had 63 points. And... <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I remember my dad. So your six-year-old six self could beat your 38-year-old self because you only scored 60 in the last game. Yeah, no, but I can dribble <laughs> with my left, though, so that's a problem. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, listen, I, I just constantly looked for things to learn from mm -hmm. and, um, you know, very observant. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you talk about this love, when does it develop? Were you, did you like it when you were five, or is it something that kind of no, gradually was two. I was born and I was born to play basketball, you know what I mean? And I played a lot of different sports, um, but nothing brought me the sense of, of, of peace and mm -hmm. of uh, escape you know, that the game of basketball did. Is it an escape when you get on the court? Is that your zen time, your, your, your solitude time, yeah, even when, though it's a teamwork game? Yeah, when I need that escape, it's there for me, right? When I need a friend, it's there for me. You know, when I need to vent, and don't dunk and the mama comes it's out. It's there, you know. So, it, yeah, the game is absolutely everything for me. Mm -hmm. when, when, you, when we talk about trying to get kids to be passionate, I don't think every kid, I don't think your situation is the norm. Not every kid is, knows their passion at two mm -hmm. or five, right? Mm -hmm. How do kids find that passion then? Well, right? I, mean, I, I think as because parents, we you, just try you, to... You, you embraced it right away, yeah, too. I mean, yeah, I, th I think as parents, we try to put them in different things. Mm -hmm try to expose them to as many things as possible, and then uh, see if there's one thing that connects with them. Mm -hmm. you know, because if it does, you don't have to tell them to do it, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's writing or painting or drawing. You know, if they have that passion, you don't have to tell them. They'll go off and do it because it's just fun. They'd rather do that than anything else. Mm -hmm. So, But as parents, it's our job to just expose them to as many things as possible and see which one they gravitate to the most. It's interesting because you, you talk about kids, right? Originally we were talking about you, now you're talking about your kids and their passions. Do you, do you kind of feel that passion for them? And, and say, hey, yeah. let's go play some basketball or volleyball or let's go swimming? Yeah, you, we, we expose them to all kinds of, I mean, they play a lot of different sports. They do mm -hmm. a lot of things creatively, you know, in writing and things like that and designing. And, and um, you just sit back and you just watch which one they move to. And then it's our responsibility as parents to try to set them up for success as much as we possibly can. Do you want them to play basketball? I want them to, to find whatever it is that 
they're passionate about. Like whatever they feel like their purpose is, then that's what I want them to do. Do they love basketball though? Your girls? Um, so I, I, my youngest one, um, she does. Uh -huh. She wants to. She wants to play, and she uh -huh. wants me to teach her how to play this summer. And you know, our, our eldest is really into volleyball. Uh huh. So and um, but we'll see. You know, passions tend to change. So you're gonna get into volleyball now? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, my sister was a great volleyball mm -hmm. player, so. Mm -hmm. We have a teacher in the family. Is there is there one moment where you can say it defined your passion for basketball? Is there a story or moment when you said, "Yeah, that was mm. that was it. That was like when I felt really passionate." No, I, it doesn't. It never leaves. Mm. <laughs> it never leaves. Like, I, you know, the game is just a part of me. Um, so it never leaves. Even now that I'm retired, you know, I, I, everything that I've learned from the game of basketball, I've carried it over into life. Mm -hmm. You know, like basketball's helped me be a better person, a better friend, a better How father. So? Well, because there's life lessons that are within the game, mm -hmm. like communication, like unselfishness, um, like attention to detail, and um, empathy and compassion. Like all those things are in the game. And uh, as an athlete, if we are aware of those things, um, it helps us become better human human beings. Mm -hmm. And you can apply that toward your post post basketball days retirement into your business world sure. your future ventures sure I mean you can apply you know I was applying that um, even while I was playing just in life outside of the game and even more so now you know in building a business and all these things you, you know the kind of culture you want to have um, you know all those things are, are um, directly uh, learned from the game of basketball mm -hmm. for me. Uh, next up is uh, the next pillar be obsessive <laughs> obsessive that's I think uh, I think a lot of people equate that with you. You know, Kobe <laughs> is obsessive in a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, we've been doing this for what? Eight years now, Asia Tour. Yeah. You know, I've been with you for a long way. I, I, the one moment that stands out out of, we've done, I don't know how many done, we've done what, 800 events. Mm -hmm. The one time was 4 a.m. We yeah. went out to practice at 4 a.m. And that was your idea to do it. But, and I then, mean, you know, all these Nike people are like, no, 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 let's not, let's not do that. And then you're like, let's do it at 4 a.m. So you got security, you got brand marketing, sports marketing. Going, no, 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 no. Let's not do it. You're like, let's do it, because that's your assessiveness, right? I mean, it, it, to me, it just makes complete sense. Not to us. But I don't like. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> see, we. All right. What you usually? I'm sleeping at 4 a.m. Yeah. You're you're working out. So well, talk about that. Okay, so if 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 your job is to try to be the best basketball player you can be, mm -hmm. right? To do that, you have to practice. You have to train. Right? You want to train as much as you can, as often as you can. So if you get up at 10 in the morning, train at 11, right? 12, say 12, train at 12, train for two hours, 12 to two. Um, you have to let your body recover. So you eat, recover, whatever. You get back out, you train, start training again at six. Train from six to eight, right? And now you go home, you shower, you eat dinner, you go to bed, you wake up, you do it again, right? Those are two sessions, right? Now imagine you wake up at three, you train at four, you go four to six, Come home, breakfast, relax, so so. Blah, blah, blah. Now you're back at it again, nine to eleven, right? You relax, and now all of a sudden you're back at it again, two to four, and now you're back at it again, you know, seven to nine. Look how much more training I have done by simply starting at four, right? And so now you do that, and as the years go on, the separation that you have with your competitors and your peers just grows larger and larger and larger and larger and larger, and by year five or six doesn't matter how, what kind of work they do in the summer, they're never going to catch up because they're five years behind. <laughs> right? So it makes sense to get up and start your day early because you can get more work in. Is that genetic? Or is that something you, you ingrained and trained yourself? No, it was Who just... taught you that? For me, it was just, it was just common sense. Like, I, I can, I can, if I start earlier, I can train more hours. And I know the other guys aren't doing it because I know what their training schedule is. Right? So I know if I do this consistently over time, it's, it, the gap's just going to widen and widen and widen and widen and widen, and they won't be able to get that back. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, it was just common sense and like thinking, how can I get an advantage? Oh, start earlier. Yeah, let's do that. When did you start doing that? Man, like in high school. High school. We start. My first class in high school was seven at seven forty-five. I used to get to the gym around five a.m. and I'd play before school. Mm -hmm. And then school would start. Who's playing I, with you at 5 a.m.? My coach. So my coach would show up, and we'd do all these basketball drills. Mm -hmm. right? So and just it, you and your coach? Just me and my coach. And <clears> sometimes <throat> it would just be me and the janitor, <laughs> and, uh, who's still there today. And, um, and, um, and then I'd play at lunchtime. That guy should get a medal. 
<laughs> I, I, I hooked him up with a few things. Um, <laughs> but I played during lunch and, and then practice after and mm -hmm. then you know, go home, do my school work and then watch a bunch of game film and games on TV and study, study film. Was that the only thing you've been obsessed about, basketball? Well, in, until recently, yeah. Until recently, yeah. Basketball dominated, you know, my, uh, my entire life for mm -hmm. more than 30 years. When uh, when I when I brought it up, like, where do you? Is it genetic, or you just learned it? I mean, how how did that idea even come up? Because that's obviously a, a pillar of mama mentality, the obsessiveness. This is just like you said. I'm gonna get up at four. Everybody's get up at six. If everybody's gonna get up at four, I'm gonna get up at two. Right. Right. How do you how do you develop that, or where do you where do you learn that from? Well, I, I think it's just you know it's just a matter of what's important to you. Mm -hmm. And what's important to you, for, for whatever reason, you know, I, I felt like um, I didn't feel good about myself if I wasn't doing everything I could to be the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. If I felt like I left anything on the table, um, it would eat away at me. I wouldn't be able to look myself in the mirror. Right? So the reason why I can retire now and be completely comfortable about it because I know that I've done everything I could to be the best basketball player I could be. Mm -hmm. Um, and so yeah, that's where it comes from for me. You can't leave any stone unturned. But the, the important thing to understand is you can't you can't shortchange yourself. Like you're not you're not cheating anybody but yourself. Right? I mean, you're tired. You're literally this far away from the line. Why would you not go that extra to touch the line? Right. So if I let him get away with that, right, all of a sudden he starts maybe a cheat something over here. Right. Not give his best over here. Not give his best over here. And as years go on, he's going to be extremely, he's not going to reach his full potential because he's been taking these little shortcuts that just add up, add up, add up, add up, add up. And you can't let that happen. Our, our job as teachers, as mentors, as inspirers, it's our responsibility to hold them accountable to those things. The, the funny part is uh, we, were, we were just talking about this kid. We we're in the back and Kobe's like, I bet you that kid will never, ever miss the line again. Yeah. It's not, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> it's not gonna happen because of that one moment. Yeah. So that that's you being obsessive, but teaching obsessiveness because that's that's what you gotta be, right? Do you you have to be obsessive to get to that level in everything you do? Details. Yeah. Don't waste time. Do it right. Perfection. Yeah, I mean it's it's, it's really um, simple. It's like whatever you're doing at that moment is what you're doing at that moment. <laughs> You know, it's like that's where the obsessiveness is having the attention to detail for the action that you are performing at the time you're performing it. And if you can have that kind of focus, you can't help but to have a certain level of, of, of obsession or attention to detail. Moving on to the, the third pillar is uh, to be rel relentless. That we know you for. You know, we see you on TV being relentless first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. Fourth quarter, attack, 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 never letting your teammates slack off. Attack, attack, attack. What, how do you get that? Talk about what is, what is the meaning of relentlessness to you? Well, it's, it's to never, you know, to be unyielding. Mm -hmm. you know, you, it's, never give um, an inch to anybody. Never, you know, like you're always going after it, always going after it, always going after it. And if there's a challenge that ensues, oh, good, I want to see how I stack up to that. So you go after it, you go after it. And it's just, um, it, it's fun. It's like you get a chance to compete against um, opponents and you get a chance to see where you stack up against them. It's like, I want to see. It, maybe I'm not good enough today. If that, that's fine. I'll be good enough the next time I see you, though. You know, and you get a chance to always measure yourself. And um, it's, uh, it, it, it's just fun to do that. So I guess that's where relentlessness comes from. Is, is it something that's also learned or ingrained? Or is it something you kind of learn over time? Um, because these things that we talk about in the mom mentality, yeah. uh, you know, for you, it's second nature. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not for a lot of people, right? A lot of it is, is trained or it's not God given. You no, know, I, I, I had to learn it as well, though, because I, I, mean, I had a year um, of playing. Like when I played basketball in Italy, I was taller than everybody else and faster, um, like the age of 11. And I came back to America to play basketball, and it was not the same thing because kids were bigger, stronger. And so I went through a summer of playing basketball in America where I didn't score one point. Mm -hmm. It was one league, I didn't score one point, and uh, it was devastating. Um, but I had to, you know, I'm not giving up. It's not going to happen. So you bounce back and you keep playing, you keep practicing, you keep practicing. But I mean, it wasn't handed to me. You didn't score one point? Not one. I mean, not even a free throw. 
And you are zero. You are how old? Eleven. Eleven. Were you playing against twenty-five-year-olds? No, I was playing against eleven-year-olds. <laughs> no, I was playing against eleven-year-olds. That's hard to believe. Wow. I know. I know. But I was playing against eleven-year-olds, and I didn't score one point. And then was was that? Did that uh? Did it hurt you? Were you were you? Well, yeah, it was very embarrassing because you know my father was a Philadelphia basketball legend. Mm -hmm. My uncle was a Philadelphia basketball legend, and now here I am, this kid with like these really big knee pads, and I'm walking around and I can't score anything. So it was like really embarrassing. Uh -huh. That and drove you? Of course it did. Of course it did. And I vowed to be much, much better. So you live for those moments where you're embarrassed, when you're down, people kick you, don't let you score. Those are well, the moments that drive you. Well, I mean, those are the moments that occur, right? So whatever moments occur, good, bad, or indifferent, I can use those moments to propel me forward, use those as fuel to um, help me be a better player. Is there a moment in your NBA career where you felt like you, you, you didn't hit that mark and that was a huge transition for you? Yeah, I always felt like I missed marks um, in was the there, league. Um, what were some of the down moments for you in basketball? Well, losing to the Celtics in the finals <laughs> in 2008. I mean, that was tough. Oh, and that hurt me too. Yeah, I mean, that was, <laughs> I was, it was brutal. And I remember all. You know, at night in the hotel room um, after we lost, just thinking to myself, I, I might never win another championship. Like, I might have just, like, this is it. It's too hard to get back here. Maybe it's not in the cards to win another one. And so I go through that night of being mad. And then the next morning I wake up and I start thinking, nah, I got to fix this. So where did it go wrong? You know, why did we lose? Right? We weren't tough enough. Okay, we weren't tough enough. Whose responsibility is that to make the team tough? It's mine. All right, so now I have to start figuring out how I'm going to lead this team differently so to make sure that when we get to the finals the next time, we are tough and ready for this challenge. And um, you know, that's, uh, that's how you bounce back from those moments. That was 2008, 2008. Right? 2008, 2008 yeah. against the Celtics. And I mean, all of Laker Nation was hurt, because, especially because it was against the Celtics. Right? It, it was painful. Celtics. It, you can't lose. Celtics, come on. God. Celtics? Well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> because also that was their that was their like 17th right yeah for their for their organization and we don't the Lakers. Talk about, we don't talk about that yeah <laughs> and then you bounce back the next year against uh orlando orlando right? Beat orlando, orlando, orlando. And then got our revenge against the celtics in 2010 did, did beating the celtics feel better than beating orlando oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah yes yeah yeah oh yeah i mean i grew up such a lakers fan and so like the lakers and celtics rivalry you just hate them everything yeah oh, like you hate them we can't there's no way i can be on a team on a lakers team that loses to the celtics twice no you know it's a funny <laughs> no, no, thing no, no, because no. um in in asia me being here in asia too a lot of a lot of fans are fans of a player and they they love that player and subsequently, they, they love that team that that player plays for. Mm -hmm. But growing up in the States, if you grew up in Philly, you were a Sixers fan. Right. And then if you grew up in L.A., you were a Lakers fan. Right. You were also a Dodgers fan. And at the time, you were a Rams fan. You, you affiliated with your city. Right. And then the city that you hated was your arch enemy. So right. you, if you were a Laker fan, you just hate the Celtics and you hate every team. Yeah. Every team that, that loses them, you root for every team against the Celtics. No question. Yeah. The yeah. enemy of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, you just want to see them do bad. Yeah, just yeah. do bad. And then <laughs> if you if you are a Dodger fan, you just want to see the Giants lose, right? <laughs> right. So right. it's not necessarily good karma, but Yeah, it's not. But but that, when you lost to the Celtics and you beat them again, that moment, that that's relentless because you come coming back, coming back, coming back, and you, you had to come back and, yeah. and beat them can't, on their can't, court. Can't give up. And then, is there, is, was, that a, was that a big moment for you, beating, beating the Celtics? It was huge, you know, because, it, you know, we seen, I've seen us as a team grow so much from 2008. You know, Powell, Lamar, you know, all our guys, like how much we have grown since the last time we faced this team. And uh, I, you know, I couldn't be any more proud of them. You know, it wasn't even about me. It was about sitting back and watching us as a group. And we just accomplished this amazing thing. And uh, now we can all enjoy it together. So, Moving on to the next pillar is to be resilient. Um, I remember this time last year you came and uh, we did a premiere for uh, a movie you did, Muse. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, big, a big part of that movie was talking about your injury and coming back mm -hmm. to be resilient. Uh, take us back to that day against uh, Phoenix, right? When you injured your Achilles? It was Golden State. Oh, it was, yeah, Golden it, State. was, it, was it, it was hard, man. Because the Achilles injury 
is, is the worst injury for an athlete. It's like the worst. It's like the, the kiss of death. And when I ruptured my Achilles, I, I knew what happened. I knew the severity of the injury, and I didn't know if I was going to come back from it. Yeah, in the locker room, you were crying. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, like, this is it. Like, my career could be over right now. So How do you get back from that? Because, you know, when you talk about injuries, you know, people sprain their ankles, dislocate your fingers, but Achilles, yeah. you don't, people don't come back from that. Well, Athletes don't come back from that to the level they were before. Yeah. I mean, how, how is to, how do you get that resilience? How do you fight that? Well, what I did is, you know, I went home and I was just really angry. And, um... Angry. I, I was angry. I was mad. I was angry. I worked so hard for us to get to the playoffs and to have a chance to win another championship, and then this happened. So I had a lot of anger. And, uh, and then from the anger, then I was sad. <laughs> and then you start feeling bad for yourself. And then you say, all right, okay, I'm done being a baby. Okay, what am I going to do now? Because I can't sit here and give up. That's not an option. So now what? Okay. How long was the cycle from this anger? This is one night. One night. This is one night. It was one night. It was because like, you, you started writing in the middle uh, of the night, right? Was, you wrote that. Uh, you, you, you wrote then that. Was, then it was, okay, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so, it was, yeah, it was one night. Um, but then, you know, you, then you start. It's a process. You look at process. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? What can I control? Surgery. We'll do the surgery. Come out of the surgery. Recover. From there, physical therapy. Okay. Physical therapy. Piece by piece by piece by piece by piece. Start running back on the court. And so I broke things down into sections and said, okay, I'm going to focus on resting right now. This is it. I'm going to focus on moving my toes and then walking. And then, so you look at every challenge at every step and uh, that's how you're able to be resilient and come back from these things. Because, uh, you know, for your field in, uh, in sports, injuries often happen, right? Mm -hmm. And to come back but you know for for most everyday people it's it's something that they can't fathom because they don't they don't have that type of resi resistance that they have to face right mm. so how do they how do they come back from it because sometimes people fail in their fields and their jobs or at school young kids you know you don't have a good test score or you don't make the basketball team or you know they have these disappointments how do they how, what is your advice to young kids to you know to to face the face this adversity how do you persevere well I <laughs> Like if you, because you you have that chemical makeup to fight through it. Yeah. Not all kids do. But but you you every kid every person has the ability to put one foot in front of the other. One step at a time. Right. So like if you're saying okay I'm going to climb Mount Everest, and you're at the bottom of the mountain and you look up and you're going I'm not going to climb Mount Everest, <laughs> right? But if you break it down into sections and you just one foot in front of the other, one step at a time, next thing you know you're at the top of the mountain. So the, the, the map, the, the plan is to set short-term goals yeah, and it, to get there. A yeah, to B, B to C, C man, to D. I, it, coming back from my Achilles, I came back from the Achilles and I was fine. And then the next year, I fractured my knee. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, oh, here we go again. Come back from that next year, tear my shoulder. <laughs> here we go again. Right? But if I looked at those things in totality, it'd be depressing. But if I look at it as just the facts... This is, this is, it happened. Can't do anything about it. It happened. Now what are you going to do? One step at a time. Achilles, knee, shoulder, any step of the way you said, screw it, forget it. Done. No more. No. Never. No. Well, no. But why? Right? Because, you know, as time goes on, I'm sitting there, um, 70, 80 years old, <laughs> and I'm going to be wondering if I could have come back from this injury. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wonder. I want to find out. We got to get to that 60 point game. See. I want to see, man. We got to get to that game. Yeah. If, like, if the critics are out there saying he's done, he'll never come back. Well, maybe you're right. Maybe you're not. But let's find out. We got to get there. Yeah. We got to get there. Last one to be fearless. You know, that's, that's something that uh, I think every young adult. Young kids, they, they, they face their fears, right? Mm -hmm. what, is, what does that mean to you, to be fearless? Why is that such an important part of the Mamba mentality? Well, I man, because I think the greatest fear that we face is ourselves, actually. You know, I think it's, um, it's not anything that's external or anything that's superficial. I think the greatest fear you face is yourself I mean, because, you know, we all have dreams, and, and it's very scary sometimes to accept the dream that you have. And it's scarier still to say, okay, I want that. It's scary. 
because you're afraid that if you put your heart and soul into it and you fail, then how are you going to feel about yourself, right? So being fearless means putting yourself out there and going for it, no matter what, go for it, not for anybody else, but for yourself. When you, when you, when you got to the league, you were 18, did you have any fears before getting there or when you got there right away? Yeah, I mean, you know, I had fears that um, everybody was going to be right. I made a poor choice, poor decision. Jump from high school to, to, to the to NBA. NBA. And I wasn't going to amount to anything. So that was always in the back of my mind, for sure. Mm -hmm. And then, so out of these five pillars, which one do you think comes first? Be passionate, being fearless, relentless, resilient, mm -hmm. or, or, or they just come together? All no, I, this funny thing is like we created these separate pillars. But the reality is it's all one thing, you know, because it all comes from within. It all comes from within us. We all experience these things at different stages and different points at different times. Um, the key, I feel, is just to be aware of those moments as they occur. Right? You're aware of a certain fear or um, a certain obstacle or challenge. Right? You're just aware of those things. And then from there, you can navigate through them. Um, but I look, them all, I look at them all as one, uh, one connecting um, thing. Because I think uh, being fearless, this last one uh, sticks out in my mind a lot because, uh, you know, being in Asia, Asian kids, a lot of times they're a little bit more boxed in, in, in thought, in mm -hmm. mentality, as opposed to Western kids. Mm -hmm. Western kids, a lot of the family, the environment, you know, ever since a young age in school, it's, it's preaching independence. Speak your thoughts, be creative, independent, you know, a lot of that. You know, it's, and it's, and it's, it's also reiterated by teachers, principals, um, mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles and coaches is to, to bring name to yourself and to be independent, to be out there and go on your own. But in, in Eastern, in Asia, a lot of the cultures, whether it's Chinese, Japanese, Korean, it's, you know, don't go out there and do crazy things. Don't go out of your comfort zone. Bring, make your family proud. You know, don't, don't bring other people attention. Just do your thing, do it well, but don't bring attention. You know, it's, and I think a lot of kids are fearful of going out of this box, mm -hmm. right? Is there advice for these kids? Because a lot of times it's a cultural difference. Sure. Right? You know, how, 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 do, how do they put themselves out there when... I think, listen, it, it's very simple. You have to dance beautifully in the box that you are comfortable dancing in, <laughs> right? So like everybody's box is different. My box was to be extremely ambitious within the sport of basketball. Your box, it's different than mine, right? Every kid here has their own box, but it doesn't mean that your box isn't as beautiful as mine, right? Everybody has their own. It's your job to try to perfect it and make it as beautiful of a canvas as you can make it. And if you have done that, then you have lived a successful life. You have lived with Mamba mentality, right? So it doesn't mean you have to go out here and do all of these crazy things. I'll have to be like this person or that person. No, what are you comfortable being? What it is that what, what is it that you want to do with your life? And once you have that, then you try to live it to the best of your ability. So, you know, uh, growing up in Italy and then moving on to Philadelphia and then to LA, you know, obviously you talk about this box, right? Mm -hmm. So is, is that box constantly changing? Are you trying to get out of your comfort zone even when you were, you know, first year in the NBA and then 10th year in the NBA and then even this year? Mm -hmm. Does that box, that this metaphorical box you talk about, does that change? No, I never try. I never looked at it as like I'm just going to, you know, uh, try something completely crazy or like just just go out of my box sort of thing. I just looked at it as I want to be one of the best basketball players who have ever played. That's the end goal. Okay, how do I get there? How do I get there? And every decision I made in my life was centered around the process of helping me eventually get there. You know what I'm saying? So I had that purpose. And once I had that purpose, every decision that I made was centered around that purpose. You think you got there? Looking back upon it now, two decades in the NBA, you know, high school, uh, Italy to high school in Philadelphia to the NBA. You spent your whole career with uh, one organization. To me, is the, your biggest accomplishment to be with one team. Thank you. Um, you look back upon it now. 
when you had your goals as a kid, you're five years old, you wanted to be in the NBA. And then when you're at Lower Marion in Philadelphia, and those dreams started to become, hey, I, I'm gonna get there, right. right? And then you're in the NBA, you set goals for yourself. You talk about all the time. When you're young in the NBA, you set personal achievement goals. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna win a game, I'm gonna win a championship, I'm gonna win the MVP, I'm gonna win this, I'm gonna win that. And then later on, you changed because you said, I'm just gonna get better. And when I, if I'm gonna get a better left hand, I'm gonna have a better three-pointer, I'm gonna have a better free throw those other personal achievements come naturally. Mm -hmm. Now you're done. Mm -hmm. Played your final game, 60 points, you dropped it on Utah, Mamba out, <laughs> right? Yeah. You look back upon it now, where do you see yourself? Did you, did you do everything you wanted to do? Did you become the best, best basketball player you can ever become? Well, did here, you become the best it's, goat? It's weird. Like I, the, my um, vision of um, what my goal is changed drastically as I got older. So like as a kid, I said, I want to be the best ever, right? And now you go through your life and everything you do is try to be the best ever, be the best ever, be the best ever. And as you get older, you start understanding that those things are very superficial things, right? And everybody has a different opinion about it. No matter what you do, I can win 20 championships. There's always an opinion on who's the best. Everybody has different opinions. And so I started really kind of understanding, maybe that's not the important thing. Maybe the important thing is to, you know, how do we, as a team grow, how do I help my teammates be better? So that was the first change for me. And then as I got older still, it became more about um, how are you inspiring others, right, to find themselves. That is the ultimate championship. So uh, won five championships, that's great. Another team won a championship this year. Team's gonna win a championship next year. Those things come and they go. But what stays is how do you use your passion and use that to inspire somebody else to create their passion, and then how can they pass that on to the next person? That is true success. Um, so my goals have changed drastically from the time I was six years old to the time I was 17, to the time I was 25, and now sitting here at 37. So now you left the game of basketball. We're here in Shanghai. Uh, we're gonna end our talk today because uh, We've gone a little bit past our limit, but I think everybody is very happy to be here, and I think they learned a lot about the Mamba, Mamba mentality, right? Um, what's, what's next, you know, for you? Well, I mean, it's, it's always teaching the game, right? Teaching the game through various ways. You know, it's, we do camps and clinics, we do those things, and, but also through storytelling, right? How can, you, how can you share stories with the rest of the world that challenges them to look internally? And, and to learn things like process and learn how to navigate the sense of self and all these things. How can you infuse that into entertainment in, in a way that pushes our culture and our society forward? You know, those are the questions that I'm really, really intrigued by and that's what we'll focus on. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest of all time, Kobe Bryant. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much.